Uh, my name is Terry Simpson, and, and I'm, I'm, uh, at the moment I'm, I'm chair of an organisation called the UK Advocacy Network, which is an, uh, a network of survivor groups in England. And personally, I'm, I'm a survivor of uh, coercive psychiatric treatment, which changed my life quite a lot. So I find your ideas very moving, and uh, you know I'm very uh, pleased that you speak out so articulately against uh, coercive treatment. And but um, w when I try to explain to people that I don't believe there is such a thing as mental illness. What, what people quite often get very angry with me and say, you're denying that people suffer, which quite clearly people do. Now, um, I just wondered if you think there's anything that, that can be done about, about the suffering, spiritual suffering, emotional suffering, whatever way we use to describe that. It almost seems as if you're saying, well, that's life, really, and we can't do anything. But I wondered, do you think there is anything, any activity that, that can be reasonably undertaken to help people? Thank you very much. Well, if I didn't think there was anything to be done, I would have changed my life course, you know, in, I, very early. Many, many things can be done. The field is wide open, but it requires a repudiation of the medical approach. I'm speaking very candidly. We can't have it every which way. It requires, uh, and this really connects to, and I appreciate again, th thank you again for your invitation, with what kind of, because my conception is that you sort of want to know something about mental health policy. I mean, what should we do? Not just throw up our hands. Now, what we should do cannot be answered in a generic form because we are dealing with individual human beings. We are not dealing with types. We are not dealing with what to do if you have a melanoma or if you have malaria. Well, we know. There are a certain number of things that will help, and there are certain lots of other things which will not help. Now, here, what will help depends entirely on that individual, on their, on his or her social network, the person's intellectual and other assets and liabilities, money, social standing, who they are, what kind of people they are surrounded by, their own spirit, what they want to do about it, the society in which they live, and some kind of, I don't know what to call this person because he's not an expert, because he's not an expert in any particular skill, some kind of helper. Minister, priest, doctor, teacher, doctor, you know, meant, used to mean teacher. Some third party who really wants to help this person and wants to adhere to the old medical Hippocratic saying, first, do no harm. If you use any kind of coercion, you are out of the picture. Force, you cannot help people with force. This is a totally Quakerish, pacifistic premise. And this is, of course, totally alien to psychiatry, because psychiatry, if you abolished all psychiatric force, there would be no psychiatry. Because you see people resent what you say, but you can imagine how much they resent what I say. Because you know, then they come, you know, there are two answers, uh, two things you come up with. Person say, well, you mean people, you don't think people suffer, which of course they do. You're not just, you just don't want to call that the same kind of suffering as suffering from backache or toothache, it's a different kind of suffering. And secondly, then they say, aha, you want 15-year-old children to take heroin. You want people to commit suicide. I don't want any of those things. I just don't want doctors to lock up people and drug them forcibly because they say we are going to prevent this suicide, which of course is all predictive. We are talking about the future. I mean, they don't know if somebody's going to kill suicide until the person is dead because the person could change his mind the last minute. Hi, um, my name is Hugh Rickards. I'm uh, a Quaker and a psychiatrist and someone who suffered from mental illness too. And someone who suffered from mental illness too. Um, I'd, I, just to kind of put you in the picture, um, I developed some mental illness or mental disorder or whatever you want to call it. Um, I was given a diagnosis 
and uh, as a result of that I was able to make contact with other people who had symptoms that were very similar to me so I felt that I belonged in a group of people who were having sharing my experience quite specifically which I found incredibly supportive. I then underwent uh, treatment which involved uh, doctors and a psychologist and um, and what did it consist of? In, in, well, that's not particularly relevant, I don't think. But what happened was, is that um, as a result of that intervention, as a result of having diagnosis um, and treatment uh, that was appropriate and based on evidence, I got considerably better. And so I, um, I take a slightly different view from you in that I think that uh, mental distress can sometimes be categorised. I don't think that stops you from treating a person as an individual in any way, but actually that I find that was, from a personal point of view, incredibly liberating and uh, very useful and improved, turn me from someone who found it difficult to function into someone who found it a lot easier to function. Do you think I was completely wrong? No. No. Uh, you have not mentioned something, and I assume that that was important, especially after the first remark, after this gentleman's questions. You implied that all this was done with your consent. You implied that in your entire narrative. Now, if so, then I am entirely applauding your approach to it. So you think that it's a... So it's only the, the coercive mental... So I'm, I'm saying I had a diagnosis of mental illness, which I was very happy with. So, so I feel like you've changed your position, because on the one hand you're saying that uh, one of your positions, if you like, is that mental illness is a completely useless concept, and then your other position is that it's just coercive treatment. And I think they're two very different... Not if you read, not if you read my books. Those are not two different concepts, because uh, characteristically, historically, psychiatric diagnoses were made against people's will. People didn't say, go to a doctor and say, like they now go, and say, you know, I think I have gallbladder disease, or I read up about this. They don't say, I have paranoid schizophrenia, do something for me. So you, and you, you still haven't said anything about whether any of what was done to you was done to you against your will at the time at which it was done. Because you, you say, that, to my mind, these are not two different things, these are two different approaches to the same phenomenon. One is whether or not mental illness is an illness, is a categorical, logical, medical analysis, and the other one is a political analysis. The, the use of force. The use of force has nothing to do with my argument, because in medicine the use of force is forbidden. No? Can you treat someone with diabetes against his will? Yeah, absolutely you can. If you call in a psychiatrist. Well, you can do it under common law or under, or under the mental health act. Well, but uh, the patient goes home and doesn't take his insulin. I, I don't follow you. Sorry, say again. Well, you are, the, you are the doctor. I mean, let's be practical about this. I am the patient. And I come to you and you say, yes, you have diabetes and take so and so much insulin every day. And I go home, I say, thank you, doctor. And I go home and don't take insulin and wait to die or take an overdose and kill myself. Where is, what is your role in this situation? You're an endocrinologist or internist. All I'm saying is that um, there are certain situations when you can treat what's called uh, so-called medical illnesses um, uh, coercively, so it's not just the field of psychiatry. For instance, if a person has a delirium, you may feel that it's your duty of care to provide care for someone in order to preserve their life. Um, and it might be the, absolutely the right thing for you to do. And indeed, the mental health allows you to do that. I'm Chris, um, Christine McPherson. Um, and I'm actually, I'm an approved social worker. Which means that um, if I work with psychiatrists, um, people are really at risk, we are really at risk maybe, will harm themselves and they also have mental illness, then we actually can assess for compulsory admission to hospital, so that's part of my role. And I was wondering um, what you were saying 
that um, it's in, if people may be really distressed and maybe we feel they have to have harm themselves and maybe could kill themselves. And in that sort of situation, we use the Mental Health Act to actually protect the person. I'm sorry? We use the Mental Health Act yes. to actually protect the person from the risk to themselves yes. or the risk to other people. Yes. I mean, that is compulsion. Yes. So what you're saying is if, the, if we don't use that compulsion, then we'll let them, we will let them um, kill themselves. I mean, if that's going to be the logical conclusion of not using compulsion, and I, I just wonder what your response to that would be. Well, I take it, uh, forgive me for answering, beginning my answer in this way, I take it that you have not read much of my writings. No. Well, a long time ago. Because this ties in with your previous question. This is a primarily political and, if you like, humanistic historical position which I have, which is not unique to me, and that is that compulsion is a bad thing. Now, let me use a religious analogy. What is a separation of church and state about in America? Traditionally, priests used to be able to coerce people because they had the wrong ideas. And after all, you don't want to let somebody die without being able to go to heaven and, and be damned. So they had their own rationalizations, and this is a history of coercive religion, okay, both in Islam and Christianity, less so older in Judaism too. In, uh, in some ways, early enough days. Now there came a time following, the, at the beginning of modernity, when people, especially in America, decided that religion is a very important thing. But they should have no power at all to bother people against their will. Now we all accept that. If you are a Catholic, or if you are a Christian, you can go to confession and tell the priest, I'm going home and kill my wife. I'm going home and kill myself. And that's called the confessional. It cannot be violated. It is not violated as far as I know. The thousand, two thousand year history of this virtually. Now, isn't, why isn't it the priest's duty to stop people from suicide? Why isn't it uh, the teacher's duty? Why is it, what, what's the connection between suicide and medicine? Now there is a historical answer to that. That medicine has become an arm of the state. They are licensed, they are, and this is what is the it that we are talking about. The it is called social control, which is what you are describing. You, you are not willing to commit yourself to whether or not there was coercion used. Now, I have written, you know, for the Mental Health Act is the latest of a long series of health legislations. This is how the whole history of psychiatry begins. Before there was modern psychiatry, Mad doctors locked up people. They were locked mental institutions before the name psychiatry. The, name psychiatry, the term psychiatry is only mid 19th century. So 1847 that the word psychiatry was coined. Go to the OED. It was coined by a Viennese doctor came from, named from Feuchtersleben. The OED said 1847. Well, but the madhouses go back much, much earlier. And what were they? Prisons. <laughs> exactly what this gentleman complains about. Bedlam. Well, obviously, modern society needs it. So, I am, this idea is entirely against the stream, except for some people. There is some, you know, mental patient liberation movements, some sociologists, I mean, Irving Goffman comes to mind. Uh, uh, this is not really within psychiatry. Even Lang was not hedging about this. He was not really against locking people up. Uh, he, he pretended that he was, but he, he didn't come out clearly about this. Uh, so uh, I think I've answered your question. Uh, yes, uh, it is not a question of letting people suicide. Where did you answer that? It is not your business to assume this power. It, it's, should you let people to kill each other in Iraq? I mean, this, is, this becomes an endless rationalization for meddling with other people's lives. Well, what, what's imperialism based on? 
You know, we want to bring English law to the Indians. I mean, some of this is, sounds really quite good. And the consequences may be quite good. I mean, the, the British influence in, on India, you know, I'm not an Indian, so <laughs> who, who am I to say this? It seems to me, on the whole, was very beneficial on that area. But that doesn't justify coercion. That doesn't justify their going there with, with arms. And some of it was quite interesting, because as you know, the opium wars was for free trade in opium, not to prevent opium use. I mean, history is so ironic about this. You know, the Chinese didn't let the British from India export opium to China. That was, that's how they got Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Now, you have to know history to appreciate the absurdity of what is called the medical model. Because it's simply absurd. But of course, as long as enough people believe in it with power, it works. But imperialism worked very well until it didn't. Hello, my name is Bernadette Lynch and I'm a mental health awareness trainer and um, a former sufferer of depression. Um, and I wanted to ask, if we think about the it as being human suffering, do you think that human suffering can, however, have an impact on our biochemistry and physiology and our bodily function, so that there is actually more of a connection between the two than perhaps we've talked about so far? Without a doubt. It's, it seems to me commonsensical that how our life goes, how we feel, influences our physiology. And is it the doctor's job to attempt to correct that if there's become um, a problem with the biochemistry or physiology? Is it the doctor's role to do something about that? Your, your questions are wonderful. <laughs> because what, is, what a doctor's job is, is defined by essentially two power sources, the doctor and the state in which he works, and the profession in which he works, which delimits it. Now, what is a doctor's job? What is an ophthalmologist's job? Is it his job to address your marital problem? Or just to give you a refraction? Just to give you glasses? Is it a, a neuroradiologist's job? to worry about your bunions, or your ingrown toenails, or your diabetes, for that matter. He's only taking pictures and of X-rays, or possibly only administering X-ray therapy. This is what modern medicine from, you know, since the 19th century, what was, how did psychiatry, how did psychoanalysis come into being? So Viennese doctors had a lot of patients who were hysterical, meaning that they went to doctors, and there was nothing wrong with them. The doctor knew it, and the patient often knew it, but wouldn't admit it. So in, they couldn't, in order to say, Mrs. Jones, I don't want to see your face again, I think you, have a, you should see to Dr. X, called Freud, or Jung, or somebody else. In America, in, again, you know, forgive me for being very down to earth, psychiatry and psychiatrists have often been called the sewers of society. And that expresses this idea. It deals with a subject and with people that most doctors don't want to deal with. Because they want to deal with dermatology, with urology, gynecology, and all these specialties. Cardiology, and so on. Pulmonary diseases, asthma, I mean, there are so many diseases. And the whole thing is, you know, the more science advances, the more complicated these things get. So we are li li living in a, an age of double talk and double think because doctors become more and more specialized. I mean, some ophthalmologists, basically all they do for four or five hours in the morning is a, a, a cataract surgery. And at one o'clock they go play golf and make $800,000. They don't do refractions. Somebody else does that. They only do this. There are now surgical groups where surgeons, because this is a very complicated operation, only do complete prostatectomies for men who have cancer of the prostate and who are young enough and who are very worried about complications, impotence, having nerves cut, impotence, loss of bladder control. Now, this can be a very, very complicated operation because this requires 
very complicated anatomical dissection of this very complicated area, pelvic area. So this is all they do. They're not, they're not only surgical specialists, but this is the only operation they do. Just like neurosurgeons only do, do no surgery. So it's a long-winded answer, is it the doctor's job? Which doctors? It is certainly not the general practitioner's job because he cannot do it properly. Now, this would be a job for, quote, mental health. But in my opinion, that won't work either because the, the, the it is too varied. The clientele is too varied. So you have to, I look upon psychiatric help, psychotherapy, as a tennis game. Now, if you play tennis very well, then your game will depend very much on what kind of a player you are playing with. You will play a much better game with a strong, against a stronger player than against some amateur. Now, the same thing happens in a conversation. I mean, this is, after all, a very sophisticated conversation we are having already. This is not an average conversation about mental illness. But that depends on your, on, on your input and on my answers. And who is sitting here? I mean, we have a different conversation. So you see, I mean, this is very complicated, very simple.